Hi, my name is Phelan Parker. I'm a professor of media studies at St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto, where I study and teach courses on video games, digital media, and media industries. My co-author, Matthew Perks, is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo, where he's completing a dissertation about community management in the game industry. A big thank you to Brendan for, for inviting us to present this work. I'm so glad to be here. This presentation is based on a paper about the impact of game live streaming on indie games that is hopefully almost finished. Uh, Matthew, I'm working on it. We're building on the wide variety of excellent academic work on Twitch streaming, but from a slightly different perspective. Rather than looking at streamers or the platform itself, we're interested in the perspectives and experiences of indie game developers. This paper is based on semi-structured interviews with a dozen small-scale commercial indie developers in Toronto and Montreal uh, who have been anonymized for this presentation. Our work is also informed by the extensive research we've done with Bart Simon and Jen Whitson on the Indie Interfaces project. Uh, you can find more information about that at IndieInterfaces.com. What we've found is that in spite of popular success stories, there's a high level of ambiguity around streaming, leaving developers ambivalent about it, even as they commit significant time and energy to pursuing it. There's a persistent popular myth that streaming is a golden key to indie game discoverability and ultimately sales, and that streamers are the new gatekeepers of indie success. Among Us is the perfect example of this genre of success story, right? An, a relatively obscure social deduction game from 2018 suddenly becomes a breakout hit thanks to positive attention from high profile streamers. Other examples of indie games that is, whose success has been attributed to streaming include Stardew Valley, Shovel Knight, and Rocket League. A handful of our interviewees have found success with streamers, although not to the same degree as these kind of blockbusters. Um, but even those developers are hesitant to pinpoint any one factor as the cause of their success. Part of the goal of this research, therefore, is to paint a messier but more accurate picture of the relationship between game development and streaming. Unsurprisingly, the rise of live streaming has influenced all aspects of game development, including the design process, and, and also conceptions of what is considered commercially feasible. In the current moment, all game developers are compelled to keep the dynamics of streaming and content creation platforms in mind as they conceptualize, execute, iterate, and launch projects and support them post-release. Most developers make a point of watching streams of their games as a kind of covert playtesting. This is seen as less filtered, a more authentic view of the player experience of the game, uh, especially when watching smaller streamers who are seen as less performative, as Christopher says here. There's this idea of giving you the real experience of a first-time player and noticing things that might not be obvious to the developers. Additionally, according to developers, streamers won't hesitate to offer pointed critique that can be painful but helpful in fine-tuning different aspects of the game, especially for early access releases. Indie developers are very conscious of streamability and watchability as they develop projects, watching the Twitch main page and rankings closely to see what makes the most popular games work well on stream. Horror games, action-oriented games, silly or comedic party games, and generally multiplayer games are all seen as good for streaming since they lend themselves to exaggerated performances of play and repeat play sessions. Linear narrative games, on the other hand, are seen as much less amenable and additionally risky because viewers may feel that they do not actually need to play the game after watching it. Some devs point to visual elements and user interface as crucial to make games work well, not only for players, but also for online spectators. So for example, having prominent timers and energy meters on the screen. Other aspects like incorporating downtime into a game's pacing to give live streamers a chance to chat with viewers or using Twitch integrations within the game to enhance audience engagement are also highlighted by developers. Some devs are dubious about these additions, however, and find having to think about streamability uncomfortable since it goes against their design instincts, as Curtis discusses in this quote. He's basically talking about designing the game to have a really good difficulty curve, but then realizing when watching it streamed that there was a, there was, there was a natural stopping point after the first world of the game before it started to get really interesting. And so streamers were sort of dropping the game before getting to the good stuff. Um, and this, this kind of clashed with his own sense of a good game design 
um, because it was this whole other factor to consider. We see here a central recurring tension around whether it is worth dedicating time, energy, and budget to features that make a game work well on stream or to incorporate Twitch integrations in ways that don't feel tacked on. And that's time, energy, and money that of course could be dedicated to other things. Christopher lists off the many ways that focusing on streaming can impact development. Additional costs, programming time, quick fixing, additional QA, um, and any sort of Put, puts it forward as this thing that you really need to think seriously about before committing to. Streaming is thus front of mind for developers uh, during the design and production process, and strategic decisions about its costs and benefits are now central to commercial indie game development, and of course also to commercial indie game promotion. Scholars like Afra Kerr and Mark Johnson and Jamie Woodcock have pointed to the cultural intermediary, intermediary function of streamers uh, and their ability to promote games to new audiences in ways that can be more accessible, potentially, to smaller developers. But as T.L. Taylor notes, streaming is of course a form of cultural production in and of itself, right? It's not a simple or linear process of promoting cultural products to consumers. It performs a wide variety of functions for a diverse range of actors. Developers see the, the potential, right? They see the promotional potential of streaming, but they know that streamers are engaged in a parallel process of transforming play into public performance in order to cultivate and capitalize on parasocial relationships. And indie game developers do not necessarily have much agency in this process. As Austin Walker argues, the platform affordances of Twitch encourage a promotional stance, but what exactly is being promoted isn't always clear. Although popular streaming success stories tend to emphasize big name celebrity streamers kind of bestowing mass attention on undiscovered gems, most of the developers we talked to tended to have more modest goals. Stewart deliberately eschews streamers with larger followings in favor of specific uh, genre niches. And so he talks about how the streamers that he targets are, are magnitude smaller, but they have a much more significant perceived cons conversion rate because they are catering directly to an audience that likes the particular type of game that they're making. In other words, quality is as important as quantity in promotion. Additionally, Actual sales are only one metric that devs use for success, and they also are looking to other metrics, often metrics that are controlled by the platforms themselves, like front page features, wish listing, or increased searches as they assess the impact of streaming. In spite of the opportunities most of our interviewees see in streaming, the strongest theme in our conversations is ambivalence. Indies recognize the inevitability of streaming as a factor in promoting contemporary games, but they frequently express uncertainty about how impactful, reliable, or measurable the promotional value of streaming really is. In spite of the anecdotal success stories that some devs shared, others report seeing no measurable results even after being featured by big name streamers. Developers thus approach streaming as a process of constantly trying new things and testing assumptions with no concrete rules or formula to follow. Even developers who have had considerable success with streaming found the process frustratingly unpredictable. Uh, when Melvin's studio, for example, invested money in the Twitch bounty board to entice streamers to play, they saw no obvious effect on sales or engagement. And so, and so he's asking himself here, what does that mean? Did it not have an effect? Is the effect just deferred and we're not going to notice it until down the line? Um, and they, they, they just don't know, right? Curtis similarly expresses deep ambivalence. You know, is it articles that make a difference? Do streams make a difference? Anything other than being on the front page of, of Steam and then no one knows how to get on the front page of Steam, right? There's this sort of throwing hands in the air of almost being willing to give up on even trying to figure it out. Much like in other forms of precarious work, exposure in and of itself is no guarantee of success. And some developers quite candidly chalk the whole thing up to luck, right? Just the sort of black box of the platform. This raises serious questions about much of the advice that circulates about indies, which is strongly success biased. And some developers argue that this is dangerous for aspiring indies who may not even realize how risky and unpredictable the endeavor is. For some developers, ambivalence leans towards a wholly negative view of streaming as too risky or even harmful to their games. 
in all of our partic- of all of our participants, Holly's perspective is the most negative, having given away numerous copies of her narrative exploration game to streamers in, in hopes that they would play it. But the result was that, as she puts it here, more people have played the game for free than have actually bought it, right? And and the issue here wasn't that the game was not well suited to streaming. She sort of points out that it actually streams really well, but the problem was that people could watch it, sort of get the gist of it, and, and not necessarily feel, the, feel compelled to purchase it for themselves. This extends beyond commercial performance as well. Um, echoing game developer Robert Yang's experiences with streamers using his queer experimental games as fodder for exaggerated homophobic mockery, Holly and Helena both expressed concerns that games depicting serious issues or marginalized identities will result in entirely the wrong kind of attention from streamers, right? Visibility on the internet is a double-edged sword here. While the influence of streaming on direct or indirect sales is difficult or impossible to pin down, many interviewees point to less tangible but equally important factors at play, such as community building and fostering audience engagement. Numerous developers note that streaming can drive increased or more meaningful engagement on social media and digital distribution platforms, which can then be leveraged in the future. There's sort of this sense of banking this engagement. This reflects the general importance of relational labor and cultivating a loyal community of fan consumers in independent cultural production in the digital age, as Nancy Baim and others have argued. Tessa, for example, uses streaming clips as raw material to produce compelling social media content for her studio, which she says works better than official promotional content, right? She sort of talks about how it's worth it to sort of make people feel like they're engaged with the game and, and, and to hype people up for, for new content that's coming out. She argues that this is a way of incorporating streamers into the studio's wider community in a mutually beneficial way, and other community managers also employ similar strategies. The forms of engagement produced by streaming are, according to developers like Carolyn, more organic or more authentic and are thus inherently valuable because they give developers more to work with as they continue to, to pursue sustainable creative and commercial practices. In this sense, developers and community managers are performing the same kinds of authenticity work that, according to scholars like Brooke Aaron Duffy and Crystal Abedin, characterizes online content production. The current draft of the conclusion to this paper simply says, in sum, shit is complicated, question mark. Our research demonstrates just how mutable and precarious indie development continues to be, and the ambiguity and ambivalence in our research is closely linked to what David Nieborg and Thomas Pohl have so influentially called the platformization of cultural production. As Alina Chia, Brendan Keogh, Dale York, and Benjamin Nickel have recently argued, this is a multifaceted process involving a plurality of platforms and platformization techniques. And indie game development is a form of cultural production that is multiply, multiply platformized. This naturally includes the digital distribution platforms discussed by Nieborg and Pohl, Dan Joseph, and others, as well as the game engines and game, game making tools uh, that are examined by Chia et al., Jen Whitson, Casey O'Donnell, and others. But our research shows that streaming and other forms of gaming content uh, creation represent additional layers of platformization that indie game developers must contend with. We could look further to how social media platforms mediate relationships between developers, community managers, intermediaries, and audiences. Or we could look at how communication platforms like Slack or Zoom structure the way game makers work together in different configurations and at different scales. There's a whole ecology of platforms shaping all aspects of game making in the present moment, and studying the often ambivalent experiences of game makers can tell us a lot about that wider context. So thank you for watching. Um, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation uh, with all of you throughout the week and watching all of the other presentations, of course. Uh, so I'll close it there. Here's our information, and I will see you uh, in, in, in the rest of this virtual conference. Bye for now.